the Sandinistas in Nicaragua have just won the election by a landslide. Why is this a very important outcome? Well, it's very important because the U.S. has been trying, well, really since 1979, to unseat the Sandinistas. Um, I mean, we have to remember that the U.S. installed the Somoza dictatorship in 1979 after years of, of, of invasions by the U.S., uh, by the Marines. Um, and the Sandinistas finally overthrew Somoza in 1979. Uh, of course, after, you know, uh, a very uh, a bloody time in which Somoza killed about 50,000 Nicaraguans. He bombed his own cities, right, using wow. U.S. aircraft, using U.S. military munitions. Um, and once the Sandinistas took over, the U.S. very quickly organized the Contras with the help of Argentina, who was under a fascist junta at the time. And they terrorized Nicaragua for, for you know, nearly 10 years. And then finally, in 1990, the Sandinistas were voted out of office, really at gunpoint, right? The voters were made clear. In fact, the U.S. ambassador went around and, and campaigned with the opposition and made it clear, hey, you vote for uh, the Sandinistas in Ortega and the Contra War will continue and the economic war will continue if you vote against him. Both will end and we'll even give you some humanitarian aid. So, um, it took another uh, 16 years for the Sandinistas to be reelected. And again, the U.S. moved quickly to try to unseat uh, Danielle uh, in the Sandinistas, claiming, of course, that they support democracy in Nicaragua when there's no evidence of this. The U.S. has never supported democracy. That, I mean, that's the insanity. And, and again, I hope I'm not going on too long, but it reminds me of what Michael Perenni once said. Yeah, I assume you know Michael Perenni. Unfortunately, he's not someone a lot of people know. But Michael Perenni said once, you know, in talking about the East Bloc, you know, he says, wow, the West always says, you know, we need to return the East Bloc to democracy. And he said, what democracy are you talking about? These were monarch monarchies and feudal states. <laughs> before the communists took over, you know. But in any case, uh, so what's important is the U.S. made it clear it opposed Ortega. Mm -hmm. The U.S. a few days before the elections passed new sanctions, another round of sanctions against Nicaragua. Mm -hmm. Again, making it clear, if you vote for the sanity, just we're going to impose these sanctions. And then within a day or so after Ortega was reelected, Biden signed those sanctions into law. So the importance is the Nicaraguan people did not bend to that pressure. 65% of the Nicaraguan electorate voted, 75% voted for the Sandinistas. When you look at the numbers, over 2 million Nicaraguans voted for Ortega out of 6 million total people. Wow. A majority, I think something like 50 percent of Nicaraguans are, are below the voting age. So you can see this is a huge number. I think I think what I saw was just under 50 percent of the entire electorate voted for Danielle. Wow, that's a turnover, a turnout that we in Western societies uh, don't have anymore. Of course. And to say that somehow and I was there, look. And I don't, I, I was an observer. I was there along with about 100, I think 179 observers. Mm -hmm. um, I think that was the number I saw. You know, we went all over the country and, and I want to, you know, you know, what, what we saw is anecdotal, obviously. And you always have to be careful of that. But what I can say is that people who came to the polls clearly came on their own volition. Mm -hmm. voted the way they wanted to, and those votes appear to be counted. That is to say, whatever you say about the elections, they were free and fair, at least insofar as that day 
happened, which is really many times the only thing you can judge in any case. So, and you know, we saw, yeah. For so a this, reason, can, yeah. Can you no. explain a little bit more about who the Sandinistas are? Yeah, well, first of all, we have to go back to Augusto Cesar Sandino because that's who they're named after. Sandinistas mm. are people who uh, uh, are dedicated to the philosophy of Augusto Cesar Sandino. So who was Sandino? He was a poor peasant um, who led a guerrilla force against the United States Marines who, ca who invaded uh Nicaragua several times in the early 20th century. The, the Marines were never able to defeat him. In fact, they could never even find him. Um, he, he was a legendary figure. By the way, and there's, there's debates about what the first aerial bombing, you know, where it took place, but certainly one of the first places it took was in Nicaragua. The U.S. bombed Nicaragua in the early 20th century, again, to try to get at Sandino. The only way they got to him was through chicanery. I think it was in 1933, Sandino was, um, you know, lured to Managua on the promise of a peace agreement mm -hmm. by the dictator, the would-be dictator, Anastasio Somoza. Somoza killed him when he came to Managua. His body was never found, and the Somoza dictatorship, backed strongly by the U.S., begins. Mm. Now, so the Sandinistas are founded in 1962. Uh, one of the main founders was Carlos Fonseca, whose, whose death and murder was commemorated on Monday. That was the anniversary of his murder. The Somocistas ended up murdering him in the late 70s, he never saw the liberation. And they decapitated him, put his head up on a spike. You know, this is this is what these people were, the, the Somacistas, they were horrible people. Uh, but in any case, uh, Fonseca and others, and also including Thomas Bore, who did survive to see the victory, uh, they created a guerrilla group and a resistance group, which ends up overthrowing Somoza. And there are a few pillars to what they believed in. They were Marxists, but they were also Christian. And, and it makes the Sandinista revolution unique in that way. And in fact, a few priests were in the Sandinista government. Oh. Uh, Father Ernesto Cardinal, his brother, uh, Francisco Cardinal, both Jesuits, I believe. And then a Marianist who was foreign minister, Miguel de Scotto, Father Miguel de Scotto, who was one of the founders of liberation theology. And while he, he, I believe his family had Nicaraguan ancestry, he was, I believe he was born in the United States. He was an American. And, and oh. He ends up going to Nicaragua, I think in 78, before the victory, and he becomes their foreign minister, and he ends up becoming the president of the General Assembly of the United Nations. Uh, not long ago, several years ago, he, he passed away recently, but he, he before he did, he was president of the United Nations. So the Sandinistas were Marxists, they were Christian, they were also primarily agrarian because Nicaragua was an agrarian society. A huge percentage of the population are small farmers, peasants or camp campesinos as they're called. And so the main you know, promise of Sandino and the Sandinistas was one, to get rid of the dictator and, and, and you know, create a democratic country, but also to give dignity and and uh, rights and land to the peasants. This was the main objective. And these things, by the way, have been largely accomplished under the Sandinistas. Um, yeah, so that, that's who the Sandinistas are. And Danny Ortega was one of the leaders of, he was not one of the founders, but he was one of the early leaders of the Sandinistas. And he was the leader uh, at the time they overthrew the, threw Somoza in 1979, and he's been the leader ever since. Mm -hmm. 
And he's been someone who's kind of kept the ship afloat. You know, he's been critical in that way. Um, yeah, so so there you go. And it should be noted because, again, there's so much misinformation. Many people, will, you will be told by Western media, oh, Violetta Chamora is the, you know, the mother of democracy in Nicaragua. She was the first freely elected president there. Oh, it's not true. The Sandinistas were in 1984. Danny Ortega and the Sandinistas were voted in in 1984 in what most people think were free and fair elections. And they held elections in 1990. And when they lost to Chamorro, they stepped down. That's called democracy. So really, it's Danielle and the Sandinistas that are the fathers and mothers of democracy there. But you're often misled because then if you understood the reality, you would know <laughs> that the opposition in Nicaragua does not represent democracy. And you would know that the U.S. does not represent democracy in, in Nicaragua either. It is the Sandinistas who carry that flame. Mm -hmm. So um, you mentioned also the U.S. interfering in the elections. Of course, they passed the, the economic sanctions, but in what other ways are they interfering in the Nicaraguan uh, politics? Well, they've spent millions of dollars supporting various opposition groups, supporting opposition newspapers like La Prensa. Um, they're deeply involved in that country. And in 2018, as the National Endowment for Democracy, one of their magazines admitted, uh, they said they were behind, that they laid the groundwork for the insurrection that took place in 2018. The U.S. backed a bloody uprising against Daniel Ortega. Uh, the economy was, uh, I don't want to say absolutely destroyed, but, you know, it, it, injured greatly during the summer of 2018 because of the conduct of violent opposition groups which worked with drug traffickers. They set up these tronques, these barricades all throughout a lot of the country, not all of it, but a lot of the country, cutting off commerce, even stopping for months trucks that were coming from other countries in Central America, right, using Nicaragua as a thoroughfare. Many truckers and their trucks were stuck there for months. They suffered greatly. The whole economy of Central America suffered. Uh, but moreover, the... Call this, is this um, guerrilla warfare? Because I think a lot of people, when they think about war, they think about bombs being dropped. But what you describe now, it's a form of warfare, isn't it? Well, it absolutely is. And, and at least 200 people died that summer. Um, were killed more or less evenly um, Sandinistas who were targeted by these people, also opposition, but also bystanders in this conflagration, which really came close to being a full-scale civil war. And that's what the U.S. wanted, of course. And the interesting thing about it was that, you know, everyone blames and they do this all the time, you know, like if in Syria, if 500,000 people died during the war, 600,000, whatever it was, they'll say, oh, Assad killed 600,000 people. Well, that's not true because many of those people were soldiers. You know, Assad was not killing his own soldiers, right? It was a war. And so people died on both sides to, to give him the full tally of, of the mortalities of ridiculous. And the same thing happened in, with what happened in Nicaragua. They'd say, oh, we're taking killed two to 300 people. It's not true. You know, again, about half of those killed were Sandinistas who were targeted uh, by the opposition. The first person who was killed was a police officer. About 2,200 police people died. And the interesting thing is early on, the opposition and the Catholic Church, which played a very treacherous role there, as it does in so many countries, but particularly the Latin countries. And when I say Latin, I would include Spain in that as well, of course, which was you know, Catholic Church very much was support, a supporter of Franco. Um, 
they called on Ortega to take the police off the streets, claiming the police were the ones committing the violence, which <laughs> largely was not true. And Ortega complied. He said, OK. He took the police out of the streets and into the barracks for 50 days during that conflict of 2018. And it, truthfully, it was a brilliant move because, one, he did what the opposition asked, but he also knew what would happen. It would show the people who was committing the violence because the violence continued. And it wasn't the police doing it. The army was always in the barracks. The head of the army said early on, hey, we defend the country from outside forces. We're not getting involved in this. They never went on the streets like Samoza's army, which did fight their people. And then the police were off the streets for 50 days. So the violence was continuing. It was who was committing it? It was these people manning these trunk cases who raped people at these at these um, barricades, killed people, attacked police barracks, you know, attacked policemen in their barracks, peacefully in their barracks. So where attacked, did this people come from? From where did these people come from? Well, some were local, certainly, but there were others brought in. We know from El Salvador, they were drug traffickers brought in to cause mayhem. And again, this ultimately proved to, you know, the Nicaraguan people who were confused at first because the propaganda and the way this proceeded at first really did confuse people as to who was doing what. They began to understand who the, who the good guys were and the bad guys were, and they ultimately called for the police come back and get rid of these people off these barricades. And it was a combination of the police and the historic combatants, by the way, who led the removal of the Tron case. So this is very important to point out. So the historic combatants were a key to ending the crisis in 2018. Who were the historic combatants? They were the people who defeated Samosa. This isn't even the people who defeated the cultures. These are the people who defeated Somoza. These are the old timers who finally decided that summer enough is enough. And they went to their floorboards and they got the wood up and they grabbed their AK-47s that had been sitting there for a long time. And they went out in the streets and they started cleaning the streets of these wow. people. And that is important to point out because Many people say, oh, you know, none of the old Sandinistas support Danielle. That's bullshit. OK, the old Sandinistas were the people who defeated these terrorists. And that's what they were in 2018. And that's not a well-known story. But that is true. And the old timers also who a lot of them were retired from the struggle, you know, who would, were just living their lives, working or not working or on their porches, smoking cigars and drinking rum, they, they've decided since that point to get more involved politically and to make sure the younger people understand their history, et cetera. So this doesn't happen again. But that conflict in 2018, again, I'm not making this up. The, 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 the National Endowment for Democracy in a publication said they laid the groundwork for this insurrection. They admitted it. They were, they were behind this. And uh, so, as you say, this is not just sanctions. Those sanctions are a form of war, too. Let's not, you know, underestimate that. But this was a real conflict mm -hmm. that the U.S. promoted. And, you know, the U.S. will never stop trying to promote that sort of thing in Nicaragua or in Venezuela or in Cuba or in Bolivia or in any country that tries to go its own way. And what's very frustrating to me is this idea that people believe somehow like they may even know about Samosa and the Contras and they know that the U.S. intervenes in all these countries. But then, you know, when the Nicaraguans say, oh, we have to arrest some people because they're working with the U.S. to overthrow us, people are like, oh, that doesn't make sense. How could I mean, seriously, like, of course it makes sense. <laughs> 
I mean, it's it's own it's what the U.S. has done for over a century. I mean, to me, I just I don't understand it. I don't. And the thing that I also need to point out is that, you know, Nicaragua, motivated by again Marxism and Christianity, has to be the one of the most benevolent revolutions in world history. Mm -hmm. They never had the terror. Ever. They didn't have a terror like the French had, like the Russians had, like the Chinese had, like the Cubans had to some extent. It was short lived, but they had a little a little terror, too. The Nicaraguans didn't. The first thing they did was suspend the death penalty. They freed a lot of the National Guardsmen and the National. And so what happens? The U.S. always uses that against them. And, and Carter, Jimmy Carter, flew a bunch of those National Guardsmen of, Guardsmen of Somoza to Honduras before he left office. They become the, the, the nucleus of the Contras. Hmm. But the Nicaraguans, the Sandinistas never had a bloodletting. And so, but they get no credit for that. Right. And so when people see them arresting people for being intellectual authors of what happened in 2018, for example, mm -hmm. they cry foul. Even though, again, this is nothing compared to any other revolution, you know, um, and that's what's frustrating. You know, the Nicaraguans have acted always. I think with the highest ethical standards for 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 revolutionaries particularly revolutionaries who did come to power through an armed insurrection, which they had to, given who Samosa was. But they get no credit for that. And, and, and in fact, Nicaragua, to me, seems to be the most scrutinized revolutionary country, certainly in Latin America. Perhaps it's, because they were so successful. Well, that's it. And, and, and many leftists in the U.S., I can't speak for other leftists, are defeatists. They've never known victory of any significant kind. And so they are suspicious of groups that actually win. Mm, uh. they yeah, they tend to like losers. They tend, seriously, they like Trotsky, who was a loser. Uh, they like revolutions that almost happen. Uh, once the revolutionaries come to power, they don't like them, you know. Mm -hmm. and. And and that's a fact. And and but look, you'll see leftists who like Cuba, but they don't like Nicaragua, and they'll say, "Oh, Nicaragua is not democratic." Nicaragua is a multi-party state. They had six parties run in this election. I love Cuba, okay, but it's a one-party state. Uh huh. So okay, uh, this would be like a real victory of the people. But uh, looking at how the U.S. has interfered. Uh, in the in the past, uh, what can we expect then looking forward? Well, again, we know that they're going to up the economic sanctions because they've already passed a new bill and a new law because Biden signed it into law, which will sanction Nicaragua more. And so they're going to be under economic um, pressure, which is going to fall, as we know, historically, it's going to fall upon the people. It's going to mm -hmm. hurt the poor and working class more than anyone. And it already is because the NECA Act was passed in 2018. And that has hurt Nicaragua a lot. Um, and not just the official sanctions, but there are unofficial sanctions that are happening. For example, no U.S. airlines fly to Nicaragua anymore. Mm -hmm. mm. I don't think they're forbidden from it, but they're playing ball with the attempt to isolate and punish Nicaragua. It used to be if I wanted to fly to Nicaragua, I had a choice of four or five U.S. airlines. And I could get an easy flight, Pittsburgh, Miami, boom, Nicaragua, same airline. That, I can't do that anymore. None of us can. So now it's a hassle. You got to fly maybe to Miami, but you got to change airlines and now take a, a, a Colombian airline hmm. or a Panamanian airline. And, you know, that gets more complicated when you're when you're doing that. Because, you know, if you have bags, you have to take them off and now you got to put them in. You got to get out of the main terminal and 
you go back through security. Most tourists aren't going to put up with that, right? Mm -hmm. Only the most, you know, only people who, like me who are doing solidarity work would, would put up with that. But that's what ha what is happening. And, it's, and so tourism, which I think was their second biggest industry, if not their first, has dried up. You know, I, I stayed in a little hospedaje the first couple of days, a cute little place in Nicaragua. I was the only guest there. And that's true all throughout the country. These people can't make a living, right? So we're going to see more of that. We're going to see the U.S. Um, also slander Nicaragua. And that's the other thing hurting tourism is that the U.S. Mm -hmm. State Department will put out these advi advisories. Don't go to Nicaragua. It's not mm -hmm. safe. Government's a dictatorship. And then, of course, people, again, your average tourist who was going to go there to look at monkeys or something, <laughs> isn't going to go. Yeah. And so that hurts them. The, the other thing that's going to get affected and already is being impacted, because I know this from my own personal experience, because I send money down there to help people. Remittances are being cut off. It's harder to send money to people. That was another big part of the Nicaraguan economy are remittances from their, usually from their relatives who live in the US. So what's gonna happen is their economy is gonna be pounded. Um, you know, the, the, the stalwarts, which there's many, again, there's 2 million people out of 6 million total <laughs> who voted for Danielle. They're gonna stay with the revolution, but people on the fence are gonna start blaming the government for the fact that things are getting bad. Um, and that's the whole point, right? The whole point is to punish the people and then hope that the people oust the Sandinistas, either through an armed insurrection or through an election like happened in 1990. Um, and the U.S. will continue to you know, fund opposition groups, fund opposition papers, things that we would not put up with in this country, mm -hmm. by the way. Um, and they're going to support some violence. In fact, and, and I, you know, I haven't seen much written about this, but when I was in Nicaragua in, I guess, 2018, 2019, uh, someone from the, I think it was from the national police was saying, that there are a few hundred armed contra type groups in the countryside oh. that still exist. And so CIA connections, right? I'm sure. Yeah. There's no question about that. So basically Nicaragua will be under what they call a low intensity war, which is only low intensity for the U S not for Nicaragua. I mean, for them, it's high intensity. And we'll see what happens. I mean, again, the fact that they won this election, the fact that they won and it was peaceful. That's the other thing. People aren't rising up um, there against the elections. Um, and the elections were held peacefully. So that's a victory in itself, you know, but the U.S. will not stop. They never stop. They never stop. So I had another question because I noticed that like in um, Western countries after all the COVID lockdowns, there are a lot of disruptive supply chains and empty supermarkets. But I also read that the Nicaraguans have food independency. And I was wondering how did they achieve this? Yes, well, you're correct. So Nicaragua is approaching 100% food sovereignty, oh. which means that they grow nearly everything they consume. And this is why in 2018, this is why the government could survive. And this is why the people survived because they were able to continue to eat because they weren't importing food. They were growing it locally and getting it to each other. So uh, this is an amazing feat. How did it happen? go back to what the Sandinistas are. They're primarily, you know, agrarian movement. And so they focused a lot on giving land to the peasants, over 100,000 peasants 
have gotten land. Um, providing free education, free health care. I mean, things which benefit everyone, but again, particularly benefit the poor and, and, and people who had nothing like that before, including the peasants. And supporting agricultural, you know, actually giving um, supplies and livestock to the peasants. Mm -hmm. uh, I was on one co-op and they showed me this giant pig that was a sow that had reproduced and they said oh yeah danielle gave us that you know so that they've really promoted that promoted food independence and and they're the most food independent country south of the united states in the western hemisphere to the extent that they even send food to cuba and, and venezuela okay wow and this is an amazing feat. And this is what will make it harder for the U.S. to succeed there. They won't starve people out. They may want to do that, but they won't be able to do that. Now, what they will be able to do is, is probably cut off some medicines mm -hmm. um, from people. Certainly do that. Uh, and other life-saving supplies and whatnot. But, but, but food, no. So... Um, that is one advantage Nicaragua has over all these other countries. And um, is the government, so what I notice in the Middle East and Southeast Asia is that a lot of countries, they don't regard the U.S. as a reliable partner anymore. So they start these economic partnerships with China and Russia. Is Nicaragua also, um, yeah, looking, looking towards other outcasts to cooperate with? Well, of course. I mean, they already have found those people. They work with Russia. They work with Iran. You know, they've done that. Now, well, I'll tell you an interesting little fact, which a lot of people don't realize. And I didn't realize it until I had a discussion recently with the Nicaraguan ambassador to the UN. You might be surprised I didn't say the People's Republic of China. Nicaragua is actually close to Taiwan. Oh. Not ideologically, but what happened is in 1990 and starting forward, the Taiwanese opened up all these maquiladoras in Nicaragua that at least at one point employed about 300,000 people. Some of those were jobs were lost during the 2018 crisis, but still they employ a lot of people. And so when the, the Sandinistas came back to power in 2007, they had to decide, okay, are we going to recognize the People's Republic of China, who we actually think a lot alike with, or are we going to stay with the Taiwanese? And they stayed with the Taiwanese, who sent the largest delegation of any country of the world to Danielle's first re-election in 2007. Uh, they sent over 100 people and made it clear, we want to keep working with you, we want to keep running the factories, we want to do development work. And again, Danielle, being a very practical person, said, OK, so they've stayed with the Taiwanese. Uh, but I'm told that the time may be coming soon that they'll go with the People's Republic, who ultimately can do more for them if they want to. Um, and that may include helping them build a canal, um, which would be the biggest canal in the hemisphere, much bigger than the Panama Canal. Um, because of the geography of, of Nicaragua, which again is something the U.S. really, really would oppose. Uh, the, the, the U.S. has coveted a potential canal there for a long, long time. They always wanted that, even back to, to the early 20th century when we had the Panama Canal because um, they always wanted an alternative in case the Panama Canal was closed up or whatever. And also they wanted a bigger one. And that's another reason for this intervention. And of course, for the Chinese to help with that would be a violation of the Monroe Doctrine of 1823, right? In which President Monroe, Monroe announced that the U.S. had sole dominion over the hemisphere. And would not allow competitors here, and 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 so that and that doctrine is still in effect. Okay, good. I think this is um, we have a lot of information to write an article about. 
Yeah, I hope I didn't give you too much. Oh, I want to throw one thing out also. Nicaragua for three years in a row, in three recent years, I'm not sure the most recent, but for three years in a row, so from like 2018-1920, was number five in the world for gender equality. Okay. Ah. And it was Scandinavian countries that well, they're like one, two, three, four, of course, like Sweden, Finland, you know, the usual suspects. I don't know if the Netherlands were in there, but, you know, the usual suspects. And then Nicaragua comes in at fifth out of nowhere, right? <laughs> and this is one of the gains of the Sandinista revolution that most people don't know about. So, oh, good. This is very interesting. Like I'm still in a process of learning myself too. Like we're covering a lot of topics and you can't go in depth in everything. So True. Um, yeah, I learn a lot. So thank you very much. Thank you. I really enjoyed this. Anytime. Ah, thank you. Okay. Well, and you too. Hopefully I, I, I'd love to come to the Netherlands sometime and speak or, or not speak. Oh, no, smoke we'll hashies or whatever. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Well, let us know because um, um, the um, how do you say the management of the newspaper? They also organize lectures. So um, so if you are here and you want to speak, then we can organize something. That would yeah, be great. Yeah, well, maybe we could talk about planning something. So oh, okay. I would like that. Great. Well, um, well, I'll see you next time then. Great. Sounds okay. good. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye bye.